Hello there, friends and neighbors. This is me, Stella Hendricks. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. So I forgot last time that I was supposed to be on chapter seven and not on chapter eight. Where's my book? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and I just skipped right over chapter seven. So uh, we're gonna do that one. This is chapter seven of The Girl in the Centerfold by Surrey Marsh. As always, I'm only reading excerpts from it. I'm not reading the whole book. And these are all just my opinions that I'll offer afterwards. So make sure that you buy the book and read it and form opinions of your own. All right, chapter seven, Strangers in Paradise. My second day at Hefner's mansion began with the most fun thing that had happened so far, breakfast in bed. I'd never had breakfast in bed. It was marvelous. A waiter brought scrambled eggs, bacon, toast, orange juice, and a tea on a little, ba on a little bed tray. Groovy, just groovy, and I felt very spoiled. Munching on my toast, I felt encouraged. Maybe my adventure in Hefnerland would turn out to be an adventure after all. I dressed, ordered the limousine, and went to the Playboy offices on East Ohio Street. All these people were very glad to see me. I was so beautiful, and they just knew I'd enjoy myself. There were lots of questions asked. One type went like this. What did I think of the mansion? Was I in the red room? Was I having a good time? Had I ever seen a place like it? My answers went like this. Thrilling, no. Thrilling, no. <laughs> the other types of questions were personal. Where was I from? When did I come to America and how and why? How did I like America? New York, did I like being a bunny? Wasn't the costume my gas? Did I like Chicago? After all this, I was taken to lunch. We went to some restaurant, which I also don't remember, and over cocktails, I asked the question that had been on my mind all morning. Where's Pompeo Posar? Alexis Urba answered, he's in Europe, Surrey. I'm to photograph you. I don't want anyone else around when you take the pictures. Alexis Urba smiled and looked me right in the eye. I wouldn't do it with anyone else there. After an extended lunch, I met with Renee Rossini at her office to sign the Playmate contract. Afterward, I returned to Mr. Hefner's fun capital. There was absolutely nothing to do. Some bunnies were congregated in the main room. We chatted, which means I listened to their adventures at the beauty parlor. I was so bored. The third day in Hefnerland was another blockbuster. After breakfast in bed, again I went to Ohio Street to see Alex. He put me into the studio to watch workmen build the sets wherein I would be photographed. It was pink, playboy pink, bathroom, pink walls, pink plumbing, pink everything. I was to pose just stepping into the shower. Everyone thought it was great. I hadn't thought of this before. That reminds me so much of the house that Jane Mansfield built with her husband, Mickey Hargaday. Uh, and the Pink Palace, I think it was nicknamed, and it had that heart pool that said, I love Jane at the bottom. And it was just fabulously decorated, very, very campy. You should look up the Pink Palace uh, with a, from Jane Mansfield. <laughs> uh, this has nothing to do with that, but it's reminded me of it. Perhaps another reason for the boredom is that everything, everything written about the place the whole aura surrounding Hefner leads you to anticipate a, anticipate a hip swinging celebrity filled orgasmic pad of debauchery. Okay, so I didn't expect the daisy chains amid the medieval armor, but I thought there'd be at least a little sin. After all, the Playboy spread on the house had 15 pictures of more or less naked girls cavorting through the house and 20 others of dancing, singing, uh, dancing, singing, swinging celebrities. <laughs> I have no startling revelations to make about Hefner. I had very little to do with Hefner. Hefner never invited me for a spin in his rotatable bed. Now I am quite willing to admit that his lack of interest in me may have been a result of my not turning him on. After all, he didn't turn me on either. But for truly various reasons, I believe the tales of Hefner's sexual exploits are greatly exaggerated. I'm not trying to put Hefner down by saying this. On the contrary, I'm trying to build him up. It is truly amazing that the notion persists that Hefner is some sort of animated dildo. Even more persistent is the belief that having been a playmate, I was screwed by Hefner. The prevailing attitude seems to be that this is an undeniable fact. Therefore, there is no point in my denying it, for I'm obviously lying. 
I've tried as hard as I know to be honest in this book, even admitting my various misadventures, there is no reason why I'd lie about Hefner. The first time I saw Hefner was on the occasion of the really of the really big fun event in the house, the Sunday afternoon movies. After about six o'clock, the furniture in the main room was rearranged to face the giant movie screen and all the sundry guests, friends, and employee, employees gathered. A few minutes elapsed and then he appeared, Mary Warren, his special girl at his side. He was very relaxed and friendly, speaking or nodding to people as he entered and reclined in a huge pink overstuffed chair reserved for him in the front row. Mary cuddled up be beside him and the movie screen came down, the house lights were lowered and the film rolled. That is so crazy to me how she describes it. She's, for all the things I disagree with her about, she's a really good writer, I think. She has wonderful descriptions. It really comes alive for me. And uh, thinking about that scene, how she described it and how he comes in and the, the reclining chair and the screen coming down and everything, it's exactly what you would see uh, you know, 40 years later with the girls next door when they have their movie night and everything. It is incredible to me how Hugh Hefner really was such a creature of habit. I think it would have driven me a little nuts after a while. I think I would have been like a girlfriend for, mm, I probably would have hung in there for a while, for like mm, seven years and then I would have bounced. I don't know. <laughs> but it's the same routine, you know, 50 years later. Incredible. It was all very impressive. When the movie was over, I saw Alexis Urba sitting in the front row. Alexis was about the only person I knew, so I went up to say hi. This is Surrey Marsh, Alex said. We're doing a centerfold. Hefner extended his hand, or maybe I stuck mine out. Anyway, we shook hands. He looked at me, smiled behind his pipe, and said, hello. That was it. He passed by, spoke to a couple of other people, and left the room. I had the very strong impression that he is a secure man, very sure of himself. He lives in a palace of his own design where he is the absolute monarch. As I get it, he leaves the premise only a few times a year and then moves in carefully controlled Playboy settings. The movies and television shows come to him pre-recorded. Obviously, he can see what he wishes to see and hear what he desires. He is totally secure in the milieu that he has concocted. The fact that he felt the need to manufacture the milieu would indicate that he is not secure in other situations. His security also extends to women. He was not interested in me. His gaze, his manner told me that. But his gaze and manner also told me that if at any time he altered his views, he could have me and would. He felt, I felt, I felt that very strongly, but that was his opinion. Hefner also seemed to me to be an extremely self-conscious man. I'd said he was a cold man. That may come from his lack of spontaneity. Everything, every word, every gesture, every effect is so controlled, so deliberate, that I had the feeling it had all been programmed somewhere. That's so interesting. It reminds me so much of uh, how Holly talked about uh, the mansion. And honestly, yeah, 100%, I totally qualified as a cult, 100%. The Playboy Mansion was like cult-like atmosphere. Oh, totally. If someone who knew Hefner better said I was all wrong about these impressions, I wouldn't argue. Someone who does know him better and probably would argue is Mary Warren, Hefner's special girl. Of all people, male, female, and questionable that I met in Hefner's house, Hefner's offices, Hefner's clubs, she was by far, far the nicest. If a man can be judged by his special girl, then Hefner must be judged by, must be judged a grand man because Mary Warren loved him desperately. I use the past tense only because I've last, lost touch. She may still love him, I don't know. But Hefner had special girls before Mary. I really don't know Mary Warren, but I liked her very much. She used to show up at Hefner's mansion in the late afternoon after she got off work. She was a lovely girl with, with warm brown hair, fine chiseled feature, features, soft voice, and a traffic stopping figure. <laughs> More importantly, she was a giver. She was interested in me. I wasn't just somebody she met. She wanted to know me, talk to me, found out what I thought and felt, my likes and dislikes. I asked her if she loved Hefner. Yes, she said very much. And she did. It came out her pores. It was as obvious as, what is as obvious as a woman in love? Every time I was with Mary Warren, I felt sad. Here she was, a lovely giving person, madly in love with a recluse. He never took her anywhere. 
Loving him was a total waste of her loveliness, givingness, and youth. Lisa Baker was a Playmate of the Year in 1967. Lisa Baker came to the mansion near the end of my stay, putting up in the blue room. We met and had several long talks together. I came to like her better than any of the other playmates I met. She was a natural sweet girl, hardly an exhibitionist. She is a girl with not, she is not a girl with a big ego. She had posed for the photographs and they had been accepted, but they would not run in Playboy until November. She was in Chicago to do her first Playboy promotion and quite excited about her pictures coming out and the promotions. Lisa and I have kept in touch since then, have kept in, have kept in touch since then, and I know a little about her. When the November issue came out, she was not pleased with the picture. Aw. Playboy reshot the whole series of photographs. Oh, that's good. <laughs> she was shown in a pink mini, uh, she was shown in a pink mini suit beside her Playmate Pink Plymouth Barracuda. That was her reward for her title. Good heavens. Three of the next five photos show her in what is obviously a man's apartment, her clothes casually discarded on a chair. Another photo has her in the chair, pool table in the background, and Lisa, dewy-eyed, beseeching that other games be played. I have a pool table and I love playing pool and I think that pool tables offer a really good opportunity for taking sexy pictures because it's an obvious reason for you to be like leaning over into certain poses, you know? I think that's great. Um, the other two photographs were taken in a bedroom, one of them in a silly pose with Lisa sucking on a sheet. None of this portrayed the nice girl I knew. I met a few other playmates. Sue Bernard was nice enough, but she seemed silly to me, always giggling like a child. Kelly Burke impressed me as a housewife and a mother for that's exactly what she was. She had a husband and a child at the time that she posed. Tish Howard, who Playboy called its patrician playmate and billed as a debutante, lived up to the image. Her folks apparently had money. She was dressed to the hilt and wore fur. She struck me as a snob. Of course she did. Allison Parks, who I met only briefly while she was on tour as Playmate of the Year, seemed hard and unfriendly. I've met one other playmate. She struck me as a show off. She was a short hippie girl with one physical attribute, a huge bosom. I saw her in a discotheque one night surrounded by a half dozen guys at the table. She wore a dress scooped to her nipples. Despite that, she felt the need to put on a show which culminated in her ripping off her wig and flinging it around while she did a coochie dance. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And Suri sounds mean. I have to say, girl, sometimes I love her and I think she's so funny and sometimes she's so mean. I think I'm such a broken record on this thing. The next time I do a book, I'm gonna do it like two chapters at a time because I feel like very often I turn up just sort of saying the same thing, the same impression over and over and over again. So, uh, oh, Cynthia Maddox, I think was the, the girlfriend right before Mary Warren. I really like how she described Mary Warren being so in love and how like nothing is more obvious than a woman in love. I really felt that way about Cynthia Maddox when she would look at Hef. Um, yeah, I, I feel like they really were like so sincerely in love and so was Holly and I feel like that is so weird. Y'all don't know who you're dating? Y'all don't know this is like supposed to be a temporary roller coaster ride? I don't know. I guess some people just didn't, maybe you lied to them. Maybe how could they know? What do I know? Nothing. It just seems odd to me. Oh, why is she so consistently rude to all of the other women? It makes her hard to sympathize with sometimes. That's true. That and her need to be constantly entertained. Yeah. Who is the only girl who she liked at all? The one who was like deeply interested in her. Like, you can't be interested in the other girls, too. I'm sorry that all the other girls do is go to the beauty parlor. I seriously doubt that. Just like she complained about Playboy having nothing but booby pictures, the other girls don't talk about anything but the hair salon. Somehow, I find this a dubious claim. And what is inconsistent with Lisa being a good girl and taking sexy pictures? Nothing, I say. The idea that you cannot be both is a very old, very patriarchal, and very bullshit idea. That is all I have to say about that. And breakfast in bed is such a childishly delightful thing to me. If I was, the, okay, when I'm the Queen of England and I have 
armies of servants. Every morning I will have someone bring me in some breakfast in bed and open up the windows and say, oh, good morning, my lady. And then they'll all help like sit up in my bed and eat my breakfast. And that will be the most delightful thing in the universe. But here's my rule for life. No matter how rich and famous and successful I get, because I'm so rich and famous and successful, I will always make sure that I scrub my own toilet. I got this idea from some other celebrity in some uh, interview that I read. I forget who it was. I wish I could remember, but I thought that is genius. I'm adopting that. No matter what, I'm always scrubbing my own toilet because you can't get too hoity-toity, I don't think, when you have to get down and scrub the john, you know? <laughs> Is something about that I feel would ground you. <laughs> okay, yeah, and she, I'm really sorry that she can't enjoy herself because the situation that she is describing sounds to me like something that I would have enjoyed immensely. And that's, you know, I, that's a feeling I get from so many of the girls who went and did the Playboy thing or the pinup thing and it turned out to be not a good experience for them. I feel so sad that, that they, would have felt pressured or any of these things. Obviously, there's no excuse for it. Just because I would have enjoyed it doesn't mean that it was a good experience for anyone else. It just always strikes me as so strange, the very vast variety of personalities and interests in this life. Like how many girls would have killed for that opportunity and loved it, and she is like feeling uncomfortable the entire time, poor girl. Ah! Man alive. So this book is super interesting. I totally love it. Now I have finished chapter seven <laughs> and I'll put it up and then I'll go on. Um, we are almost done. I, maybe I can start consolidating multiple uh, chapters into that one. That was a pretty, or into one. That was a pretty long chapter. So we'll see how it goes for the rest of these. And I will talk to you pretty soon. I'll catch you all on the flip side.